morning our scripture readings from Genesis chapter 23, verses 1 through 9. When Sarah reached the end of her life, she was 127 years old. She died at Genesis. Arba, a city known as Hebron in Canaan. Abraham went to the inn where her body was laid out to mourn and weep over her. And when he got up from his place beside her, he spoke to the Hittites, who had been his neighbors for many years. And he said to them, I am a stranger and I'm an outsider living here among you. In my heartache, I am asking you please to allow me to obtain some property here among you so that I can have a grave site for my dead wife. This would allow me to give her a proper burial. The Hittites conferred and they answered Abram, Abraham by saying, Listen, my lord, we recognize you are a powerful prince among us, and God is certainly with you. Bury your dead in the best of our burial places. None of us will deny you any tomb so that you might properly bury your dead. Abraham got up and bowed in respect to the people of the land, the Hittites. And he said to them, If you are really willing for me to give my dead wife a proper burial, then would you please ask, Ephron, who was Zohar's son, for me if I might buy the cave of Machpelah in the tract of land he owns located at the end of his field. With you as my witnesses, I will offer him full price for the property as a place to bury my dead. And continuing on in verse 10. Now it happened that Ephron was sitting right there in the Hittites. He personally answered Abraham so that all those present at the city gate could hear. No, my lord, listen. I will not sell it to you. I will give you the field and, and the cave that lies on the property. In the presence of all these people, my people, I give it to you so that you can go and bury your dead. Abraham again bowed in respect to the people of the land and replied to Ephron so all those present could hear. Please, listen to what I have to say. I will gladly pay you a fair price for the field. Please accept it from me. That way I can bury my dead in peace. Ephron answered Abraham, My lord, listen to me. The property is worth ten pounds of silver. I mean, surely that is an amount we can agree on. So go, bury your dead in peace. So Abraham accepted Ephron's offer. And he weighed out the silver for him in the amount they had agreed upon in the presence of the Hittites, ten pounds of silver, according to the weights among the merchants of that time. So it was that the field of Ephron in Machpelah, east of Mamre, the field with the cave in it and the trees on it, all passed to Abraham and became his legal possession in the presence of the Hittites and all those officials present at the city gate. <clears throat> After the agreement was made, Abraham buried his wife Sarah in the cave in the field of Machpelah, east of Mamre an area now known as Hebron, in Canaan. The field and the cave in it became Abraham's property with the approval of the Hittites. Now he had a proper place to bury his dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, 
And almost every Saturday we would go there, we would have donuts and coffee or chocolate milk, and uh, we would sit and we would talk for a couple hours. <coughs> I remember that. I remember uh, whenever my parents would be gone on vacation or a trip or something, uh, we would often stay at, at Poppy's house because it was right nearby. It was just two houses down from where we lived at the time. And, uh, we would stay there, my brother and I. And I remember uh, there would be many nights we would uh, be having oh. dinner, and after dinner we would either have a uh, homemade applesauce, sometimes the cinnamon kind, uh, or we would have canned peaches. I love me some peaches, and we can we could go through three, four cans, jars of peaches a week. I remember. Uh, I remember my grandpa, Poppy, he, he, could, he could fix anything. Now granted, it probably wasn't up to code, and it probably wasn't uh, the proper way to fix it, but it could be fixed. He would go into his shop, uh, his shop which was covered in, uh, covered in, in like this residue of oil and cigarette smoke. Uh, he was a smoker. Uh, covered in this stuff, it would be a mess, there's tools all over the place, but he knew where everything was. And he would have some lawnmower disassembled, and it would have these things just sticking out of it, hanging off the back, and you had no idea what it was going to be for. But he was creative like that. I remember uh, he used to garden a lot. He used to garden for everybody. And uh, there was this one time he, he was gardening for this guy, and he had like 40 acres of potatoes. Just... He wasn't a big time farmer, didn't have the big machinery. He would till with a lawnmower with a tiller on the back, okay? So, just a one-man job here, 40 acres of potatoes. And we ate a lot of potatoes <laughs> for months. I remember these things. I remember I was... Uh, in college, my freshman year, and I would come back every weekend. I went to Lincoln, so it was just a quick trip back. And every Friday, when I would come back, I would I would stop by Poppy's house and I would talk with him, go over my week, catch up. Uh, we would just talk about whatever, whatever had happened in our in my week, whatever had happened in his week, whoever had happened to stop by. Uh, we would just share things and laugh and tell stories. I remember I was uh, a sophomore in college, it was uh, the winter of 2007, in uh, January of 2007, and uh, I was sitting in my dorm room and, and got a phone call that said that he had passed away. He had pneumonia for a couple weeks and uh, compounded with all of his heart issues and diabetes and all of this other stuff. Uh, he was a smoker for decades, had a lot of health issues. But pneumonia was the thing that took him. And I remember, I remember getting that phone call and just hopping in my car and going out and driving and just crying my eyes out. And then I came back to the dorms and my, my brothers, uh, my, my dorm mates, um, they just loved on me, uh, hugged me, prayed for me, with me the rest of the evening, the rest of the week. My mom uh, was the one who had to kind of organize the funeral because she likes to do those types of things. She's very detail-oriented. And so she made sure that all the details were lined up, everything was ready to go. And uh, she, she's a bit of a perfectionist. She likes to do things very well, which made me aware about it. And she, I remember standing in our den of my parents' house and Mom was working on the programs for the, for the funeral service. She was so stressed out about the whole thing, um, trying to get the picture right, the colors were off, the, the font was the wrong size or in the wrong place and it needed to be moved and she was just getting really, really stressed. And, and I, I remember standing there and I said, Mom, why, why are you doing this? Why, why, why are you getting so worked up about it? Why, why you, it, it? It'll be fine, it's just a bulletin. I'll never forget, she turned around and she looked at me and she had tears in her eyes and she said, I only get one chance to do this right. 
we only get one chance to do this right. We're going to be in Genesis today. Genesis chapter 23. So if you have a Bible, please turn to Genesis chapter 23. Now we've done a little skipping back and forth this week and last week. And next week we'll be back on track. But I did this on purpose, don't worry. If you remember a couple weeks ago, in Genesis 22, Abraham was told by God to take his son, his only son, whom he loved, Isaac. Everybody say Isaac. Isaac. Took Isaac up onto Mount Moriah, and he was supposed to sacrifice him there. Now, Abraham, he obeys God. He takes Isaac up the mountain, ready to do what is necessary, ready to obey God to the, to the nth degree. And just as he's about to prepare that fatal blow, God stops him and he provides a ram in Isaac's place. It's a great story. And Abraham and Isaac, they celebrate, they hug. Abraham is glad he didn't have to kill Isaac. Isaac is glad that he didn't have to kill Isaac. And they go down the mountain. And we remember God's provision. And then we come to Genesis 23. In verse 1, it says, Sarah lived to be 127 years old. She died at Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went to mourn for Sarah and to weep over her. We've been looking at Abraham and Sarah's life for the last several weeks. They've been, uh, we've looked at decades of their life. We remember when Abraham and Sarah were first starting out uh, at Abraham's dad's house, and God told him just to go. And I, you could almost hear Sarah wondering why we're, we're comfortable here, we're, we're provided for here, why do you want to just go? Does this seem a little loud? I feel like I'm hearing some echoing. Why do you want to go? And so they, they do it because it's the Lord's will, they load up, they take off. You remember Abraham and Sarah, they, they once, well, they twice lied about their relationship. Are they really married? Are they just brother and sister? What's going on there? That's, neither one of those times worked out very well. You remember Abraham and Sarah, they, they did travel with Abraham's uh, nephew, Lot. Everybody say Lot. 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 <laughs> and that lasted a while until their land couldn't support both groups and they had to split and then Abraham got involved with a war and then Lot's city burnt down and there's all sorts of things. It's been a long life for Abraham and Sarah. If we do our math right, Sarah is 127 years old here when she dies. 127. <coughs> that means that she was with Abraham, married to Abraham, for 62 plus years. 62 plus years. It's incredible. That's a long marriage. A long time to be with one person. A long time to commit again and again daily. And yet, they did it. Throughout all the hardships, all the struggles, all the confusion, all the ups and downs, Abraham nearly killed their son. And they made it. <coughs> and so, the text says that Abraham mourned and he wept. He wept over his wife, Sarah. Now, as we're reading through that, we think, okay, no big deal. He cried and he cried. We get it. But those are two different words there. Mourned and wept. Uh, it basically means that Abraham mourned. He went through the ceremony. There was a, a ceremony like we have today. Some sort of uh, going away, funeral type of procession. He went through the process that society had for him as he sang goodbye to his wife. But emotionally... Abraham was still very tied to his wife, and so he just cried from the innards of himself. He just let it out. 
There's something to be said about taking time to properly mourn those who have gone. How do we, how do we honor the dead? Abraham continues, Genesis 23. Verse 3, it says, Then Abraham rose from beside his dead wife and spoke to the Hittites, the people who lived among him, or around him. He said, I am an alien and a stranger among you. Sell me some property for a burial site so that I can bury my dead. Now this is a big deal. It might not seem like it, but it is a big deal. Abraham has never, everybody say never, 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 never admitted that he was an alien. Or a stranger. Here he is on somebody else's turf, somebody else's ground, somebody else's property. He's been allowed to live there. And yet, it takes the death of his wife to realize, God wants me here, but this, this, isn't, this isn't my home. That's not where I belong. Abraham didn't own any property. He had all of these resources, all of these people, all of this influence. Uh, it says in the text that the, the people he lived with recognized him as a mighty prince, and yet he didn't own a speck of ground. In fact, by the time that Abraham dies, the only ground that he will own is this land that he's about to purchase. Interesting how we spend so much time in our lives trying to acquire things and grow and expand, and yet the only piece of ground that we end up owning is the one that we're buried in. He admits that he's an alien. Now, I don't know about you, but any time that I see the word alien, I do not think stranger. I think little green men. I think little farm home, right? I, I think men in black. I think uh, aliens. I think close encounters of the third kind. That's a little before me. I, I think these things. Now, I'm sure you all are familiar with these stories, these movies, these tales. You, you know about aliens. You saw the, the tabloids. Any time that an alien shows up in a movie, a story, a whatever, it doesn't matter what they look like. It doesn't matter what they say. How are they treated? Not very well, right? We come in peace. Sure you do. And so Abraham admits that this world is not his home. He is here as a visitor, and oftentimes visitors aren't treated well because we like what's comfortable, we like what's around us, we like what we see all the time. If somebody who's different than us shows up on the scene, we're a little unnerved, we're, a little unnerved. we're scared. There's something to be said about how we treat visitors, even in the church. But alas, that's a different sermon for a different day. And so Abraham admits that he's an alien, a stranger here. He recognizes that this world is not his home. There's a man by the name of William Law. Everybody say William Law. William, William Law. Law. William Law was a devout Anglican priest. Devout Anglican priest. He lived from 1681 to 1761. Uh, and William Law wrote a book called A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life, which is a book that will smack you upside the head. But William Law was once quoted as saying, people who are dying recognize what we often forget, that we are standing on the brink of another world. People who are dying often recognize what we often forget, that we are standing on the brink of another world. If you don't believe me, go to the hospitals, go to somebody who's terminal, go to somebody who has a serious illness, and try talking about the everyday things. So, who you got in the Super Bowl, Pete? 
he doesn't really care about the Super Bowl. Alright, sure got a lot of snow today, didn't we? Okay. Their, their mindset is different. Their perspective is different. Their view on life and the world and the people in it is different. Because people who are dying recognize what we often forget. That we are standing on the brink of another world. There is something greater and much more important beyond this life. And Abraham realizes that. He's brushed up against death. His closest partner is gone. And suddenly he sees the world with new eyes. He's honest about the situation that he's in. And then, then he begins the negotiations. Which is a little strange, I think. Uh, you would think... It would just be as simple as, this is the price, let's do this. But there's this back and forth in Genesis 23. This negotiating that goes on. Uh, if you look at the text, and just skim through it there in Genesis 23, you'll notice, uh, if you have the NIV, or the original language, either one, uh, the, the word listen, which is the Hebrew word shema, is mentioned five times in 20 verses. Listen. No, no. You listen. No, no. You listen. No, you listen. Just back and forth. Now, it's not a listen, I'm trying to say something, you better be quiet type of listen. It's a uh, this is what I have to say. This is the official decree. This is uh, what we're trying to put forth. This is a business deal that happens at the city gates. You'll remember uh, important judgments and things happen at city gates. Business deals go down at city gates. And so this transaction had to be done at the city gate. And so they were making these official statements. That you listen to here. And you listen to me. And this is my proposal. And they're very respectful about it. If you'll notice, there are lots of, Sir, listen to us, verse 6. And then on the other side, Please listen to me, verse 8. And then on the other side, verse 11. No, my Lord, listen to me. They're, they're using respectful terms. They understand who Abraham is. His actions, his reputation speaks for him. First off, they want to give him the field. Take whatever, whatever land you want. You've earned it, Abraham. Abraham, I remember, you, you've lived with us for so long. Abraham, I remember my car was broke down. My camel had a flat hoof. And you came and you helped me out. Abraham, I remember that day it was really windy. We had sand in the living room. And you helped us clean it back out. Abraham, I remember that day. Uh, my wife thought she had eggs. She didn't have eggs. And so we needed some eggs. And you said, I have no problem. And you brought some eggs. Abraham had developed a rapport, a reputation with the people around him. And so... When it came time, when Abraham had a need, the people wanted to respond generously. His actions, his reputation spoke for him. How should we honor the dead? Through our very lives. Memorial is a big deal here at Park Street Church, is it not? It's a big deal. When someone passes away, oftentimes we, we uh, donate money, we give different things so that the church can continue. This table, for instance, donated in memory of. The stained glass, in memory of. The organ, in memory of. The courtyard, in memory of. Several other different things that I'm not even aware of in memory of. And we, there is absolutely nothing wrong, hear me again, there is absolutely nothing wrong with memorial. There is absolutely nothing wrong with wanting to donate and give and have something to commemorate the life of somebody because that life matters. That ministry matters.
But I wonder, I wonder if we let the memorial speak while our lives were silent. I remember, I remember my grandpa, Poppy, he loved Dr. Pepper. Loved Dr. Pepper. Even before they told him that it had 23 unique flavors. <laughs> he used to drink Dr. Pepper by the case. He would go through three, four, five cases a week. He loved Dr. Pepper. <coughs> and now every time that I drink a Dr. Pepper, I think of him. I think of his life. Memorials matter, but they shouldn't be the only thing. Father, I ask that you be with Don, whatever his issue is, whatever's going on. You know the situation, you know what's needed. So we place it into your hands and trust you completely. So he went back and forth. He found a place that he liked and he purchased it for 10 pounds of silver, which is a, a, a little steep, honestly. But Abraham knew what needed to be done. He knew he could heckle with the guy, he could probably get the price down. But he could hear Sarah's voice in the back of his head. Oh, Abe. Hey. <laughs> Just pay the man. He was not about to dishonor his wife's memory by going back and forth and arguing over money. Nor was he going to hurt his own witness with this man, with this community by holding on to a piece of silver. Abraham realized that there are some things that are just worth more than that. And so Abraham buried his wife in the cave of Machpelah, east of Mamre. He he takes her in there and he prepares to say goodbye for the last time. His wife of 62 years, he, he knows this is the right thing to do and he, he says his goodbyes. And he comes out of that cave and there's sun shining and he, he looks he looks off to the east and or off to the west, excuse me, and he and he sees Mom Ray and he sees he sees some really big trees there. And he thinks to himself, I remember. I remember like it was just yesterday that that's my old house. That's where I used to live. I remember having my tent set up there. I remember, oh, what was it? I was working really hard. It was hot. It was the hottest part of the day. I remember. I remember the tent was set up against that tree there and we had visitors come. God came and he spoke and he told us that we were going to have a son a year from then. I remember that like it was yesterday and I remember, I remember Sarah, she laughed when she heard that. I miss that laugh. But then he sees his son Isaac, he sees, he 
sees his mom's eyes in Isaac and he knows this is I, I need to continue from here. Death is a hard thing for us to talk about. It's something that we've all gone through. We've lost a friend, a loved one, or somebody. It's one of those things we, especially as Americans, we want to distance ourselves from. But it is incredibly important to remember these people <coughs> who have come before us. <coughs> the day of my grandpa's funeral, we, uh, we all dressed up, red ties. His favorite color was red. Lots of people came, and, and we had a good, a good service. After the service, we had the funeral dinner in the next part of the building, and uh, one of the things that we did was we handed out cans of Dr. Pepper. Count of three, we all cracked them open, toasted one for popping. But I don't, I don't let his memory hang in the can of Dr. Pepper. <coughs> there's, there's something. <laughs> that happened as I grew with him, as I, as I learned from him. There was something that happened deep inside of me. Now, his memory continues on every time that I work hard. His memory continues on every time I have to make the house a little warmer. His memory continues on every time that I want to spend time with my family. See, I have not left his memory in a can, but I have become a living memorial. I think that's what we've been called to be. I remember at the graveside, I hadn't cried this whole time. Visitation, I was fine. Funeral service, I was fine. We got to the graveside service, and uh, somebody played the flute, somebody else uh, said some words. And there was, at some point, I just lost it. I just lost it. And I remember I turned and I buried my face right here in my father's suit, in his shoulder. And I just cried, and I cried, and I cried. And you want to know the cool thing? He cried with me. My dad, who, who, <laughs> he just doesn't cry. But at that moment, he cried with me because he was hurting too. And he was hurting for me, and he was hurting for him, and... Our Father in Heaven knows the pain that we go through when we lose somebody we care about. And He cries with us. He suffers with us. But He longs for us to bury ourselves in Him. To live out our lives in such a way that not only do we set up icons and memorials and monuments to those who have passed, but we become the monuments. And the way that we talk with people, the way that we live, the things that are important to us. This week, I encourage you, sit down with somebody, tell some stories, and become a living memorial. Father, we thank you for this day. 
thank you for the way that you've moved in our lives. We thank you for the things that you've done. We just ask that you would help us live out the memory of those who have passed on. Father, we do these things to remember and, and to, to recognize the acts, the mission of those who have gone before, but we want their memory to stay alive in us through the things that we do. God, I pray that you would just help us, lead us, guide us, break our hearts for what breaks yours. Thank you for your signs. In his name we pray. Amen.